palpate um, some of the landmarks in the forearm and the wrist. And um, so the first one that we're going to look at is the um, epicondyles of the humerus. So um, when you look at somebody's elbow, the epicondyles of the humerus are the uh, most lateral and medial um, bony um, protrusions that you find on the side of the elbow. So they're very easy to palpate. They're um, landmarks for goniometry, so those are good ones to know for elbow flexion and extension. So if I could just have you bring your elbow this way, of course the olecranon process is um, right here. Um, the olecranon fossa is deep to that. So he's got his um, triceps relaxed and so we can really palpate that olecranon fossa. We can get right in there. Um, just above, and I'm just going to rotate your arm, there we go. Just above the um, epicondyle is the supracondylar ridge of the humerus. So um, we know that there are muscle attachments there and it's this nice bony ridge that we can really palpate. That's the lateral supracondylar ridge. On the medial side we have a similar structure. So here the extensor muscles um, of the wrist and fingers attach here and they come down. It's very difficult to tease out the individual muscles. In this group of uh, muscle bellies here, sometimes people will call it the extensor wad because it is a wad of muscles, so you can get that big muscles. Well, what we find underneath the extensor wad is the radial head. So you can palpate the radial head anteriorly, um, coming directly down from the antecubital fossa, um, and you have to dig in a little bit through the extensor wad. So I'm going to have you um, pronate and supinate your um, forearm. And so if you get right underneath that extensor wad and the person pronates and supinates their forearm, um, you can feel the radial head rotating. So I've got my thumb posteriorly here, just um, lateral to, and uh, distal to the uh, olecranon process, and I've got my middle finger anterior, and I can feel the head of the radius rotating when he pronates and supinates his um, forearm. Okay, so we're going to go down distally now. So following that down, so I don't expect you to be able to tease out the individual muscles, but you should be able to say that these are the extensors and um, these are the flexors on the coming down on the medial side. Um, so that's pretty easy to do. I'm going to have you move your arm back just a little bit. Thank you. Okay, so as we come down um, to, so of course we have the radius on the thumb side, the radial side, and the ulna on the um, pinky side. And so this little bump right here, there's the, um, the, main, the head of the ulna, which is the big end of the, you know, the small end of the ulna really, but it's that big um, lump right there. And the little point on it is the um, styloid process. So very easy to find. The radial styloid is, strangely enough, on the radial side and also is very easy to find. It's that little point. Um, the distal uh, radial tubercle or the, um, dor the um, Lister's tubercle, in the book it's listed just as tubercle. <laughs> on the um, labeling of the distal radius it just says tubercle. Um, if, if you follow the radius along distally, right when you get to the edge of the radius at the radiocarpal joint, you'll find this little lump here, and that is Lister's tubercle. And what it does is it provides sort of some um, control of the tendons that are coming down through here from the extensors that then come into the back of the hand. So then when we get to the wrist, we can start to pal palpate the carpal bones. You can palpate the carpals from the dorsal or posterior um, part of the hand or from the, um, the anterior or palm or um, part of the hand. With some, with, especially with the um, distal row of carpals, the hypothenar eminence on the pinky side and the thenar eminence on the thumb side um, provide you some muscle to go through, so it's a little bit easier to palpate those on the dorsal side. So um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to just start at the um, we're going to start at the lateral or the radial side, and we're going to go over um, medially. So um, I'm going to have you extend your thumb 
So when he extends his thumb, we can see the tendons pop out a little here, and we get the anatomical snuff box. So the scaphoid, which is the proximal portion of the carpometacarpal joint, the first carpometacarpal joint, is the floor of the anatomical snuff box. So if you find your anatomical snuff box, you have found your scaphoid. Um, you can also palpate it from the... Um, the anterior or palmar aspect, and it's um, it's the most um, lateral uh, bony landmark in the wrist. Okay, so then um, going um, medially, we're going to find the lunate. And if you flex and extend the wrist, you will feel the lunate pop out, um, go down, pop out, go down. You'll feel that lunate. Okay, remember it's the most loosely articulated um, carpal in the proximal row, and um, so it is the most frequently dislocated. The scaphoid is the one that's in the line of force, so it's the most frequently fractured. When we go over one over from the lunate, um, sort of right at the side of the wrist, just distal to the ulnar styloid process, you will find the triquetrum. I have a hard time saying that word. I sound like Elmer Fudd when I say it, but anyway, that's where we're going to find it. Um, it can be used as a goniometry um, landmark for um, flexion and extension of the wrist, but frequently the ulnar styloid process is used um, instead, so you can use either of those two. When we go to the palmar side, I'm going to come over on this side of the hand so we can get a better view of the palm, um, we get the pisiform. So the pisiform is a little sesamoid bone that is actually embedded in the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon. So I'm going to have you um, flex your wrist and go and ulnar deviate, which is going towards your pinky a little bit, and I'll feel that tendon pop right out into my finger when he does that. And the pisiform is the, you can think of it almost as the corner, the medial corner of your palm. So I like to divide the palm into quadrants. So it's roughly square, and if I divide it into quadrants, in this quadrant, in the lateral um, proximal quadrant, I find the um, thenar eminence and a little bit of the adductor pollicis muscle belly, and, um, and the transverse carpal ligament runs right across here. That's the top of the carpal tunnel. Um, in the proximal medial quadrant, um, we have the triquetrum, the pisiform, and the hamate. Okay, so in this quadrant, um, we have those three um, carpals, and the hamate is in the distal row. If you want to find the hook of the hamate, take that square of the quadrant, draw an X right through it, and your hook of the hamate is going to be right at the X. So you have to go pretty deep to find it, but um, the ulnar nerve runs around that hook of the hamate, and you can feel that. The patient can feel it, and you can feel it as you're doing it. Okay, in the distal medial quadrant, um, you are going to find the fourth and fifth uh, metacarpals. And in the um, distal lateral quadrant, you're going to find the um, second and third metacarpals. And so... Um, the metacarpals are pretty easy to find because you have the good landmark of your knuckles. Those are your carpometacarpal joints. They're the heads of your metacarpals and the bases of your proximal phalanges. The interphalangeal joints, it's, um, this, the first interphalangeal joint is the, uh, or the proximal interphalangeal joint is the head of the um, proximal phalanx and the base of the middle phalanx. The distal interphalangeal joint is the head of the middle phalanx and the base of the um, distal phalanx. So those joints are easy to find. Um, the, um, so I'm going to have you extend your fingers like that. There you go. You can see the tendons pop out a little bit. You can palpate those um, extensor, the extensor digitorum um, tendons. Go ahead and relax. Good. You can also palpate all of the carpometacarpal joints. So if you follow the second metacarpal, if you follow the first metacarpal down, you'll run into the joint line right there. That's the saddle joint. That's that first carpometacarpal joint between the first metacarpal and the scaphoid. If you follow the, the second metacarpal down, you'll find that joint. 
it's the joint line between the second car uh, metacarpal and the trapezoid. Okay. The um, if you follow the third metacarpal down, you'll find the joint line, and that is the joint line between the third metacarpal and the capitate. Remember, the third metacarpal is, or the middle finger, is the point of reference for abduction for the hand. Okay, if you follow the fourth or the fifth metacarpal down and you find that joint line, you'll, run, that you'll be on the hamate, on the dorsal side of the hamate. The hook is on the palmer side. Okay, so hopefully that'll help you find um, landmarks a little bit more when you're practicing. And um, hands are really easy to palpate um, because most of the things are really easy to find. Anatomical snuff box is easy to find if you have the person extend their thumb. And then you found the floor of it, that's your scaphoid. So um, take a look at your list, practice those things, and um, you'll be uh, in good shape to do well on the practical in the next lab.